Okay, welcome to the Inspire podcast. Uh, today our guest is uh, Abdul Mazamdar, who has recently joined PSR Solutions as Development Manager. Uh, Abdul's background uh, and yes, credibility, uh, working uh, at CITB uh, in the past and Kia, creating programs uh, to inspire young people um, to gain access to the construction industry. It's great to have you today, Abdul. I'm looking forward to, um, to speaking with you. What was it like? at uh, CITB. Well, Damien, thank you very much and uh, thank you for the welcome. Uh, yeah. uh, thank you to everybody at PSR for giving me such a, a warm welcome. Well, working at CITB was a real eye-opener for me because um, CITB were in a unique position where they had their finger on the pulse in relation to apprenticeship qualifications and obviously uh, assisting the uh, construction industry in um, progressing the, the individuals within the organisation and of course we also had our finger on the pulse in, in respect to what the employers needed, their wants, their needs, their desires and mm. uh, of course any issues they were facing in, in regards to attracting talent to the industry as well. Okay and this will come on to the sort of levies uh, later in this. We're just interested, do you think that the construction industry really appreciates and understands the CITB levy? Um, to be honest, uh, yes, the people who are in, uh, engaged and, and, and the, the companies, especially the larger ones that are registered with CITB, do have a good understanding of the, of okay. the CITB levy and obviously uh, the, the grant process as well. What I think uh, companies are struggling with is, is the uh, introduction of the new apprenticeship levy. Right, okay. Uh, because I think not a lot is known about it. It was only introduced two years ago. Okay. And I think, uh, especially with uh, SMEs, they're struggling to grasp the, the kind of... Um, administration everything else that goes behind it and the understanding of how much they can claim what they can claim etc etc so the companies simply just don't have the expertise within their organizations to help them with the apprenticeship levy okay okay well i think if we park the uh, the levy up and we'll come mm -hmm. on to that i think what i'd like to do is just give a bit of a a background in terms of the impending talent crisis within construction um i think we we're, we're aware of uh, the probably hundreds of thousands of people we need to get into the industry to complete the projects. Why do you think construction has this uh, this crisis of talent? Well, when I when I speak when I have been speaking to clients, uh, the, the message I'm getting clearly through is that they have a work we have an aging workforce of the construction okay. industry. Have a lot of people who are coming to the, uh, close to retirement, but they're not getting in as many people at the ground level uh, to fill those gaps. If that makes sense, okay. early, early talent. Uh, and, and, and people coming into the industry right, seems to be an issue. Uh, not only that, but we obviously have the issue of Brexit as well. Yeah. Um, so, um, depending on how Brexit goes, and you know the movement of EU citizens coming into uh, the UK, uh, mm -hmm. professionals coming into the UK, if it becomes difficult or hard for them to do so, we're going to have a shortage of, of talent there as well. So. Um, there's, a, there's, there's two issues here we've got uh, okay. with the construction industry but not only that if we're not getting in citizens from the, uh, from the EU professionals from the EU it's going to be across industries not just for construction right okay okay um, and in terms of um, I guess from young people mm -hmm. do you think there's a, a misconception of construction about what it is are people just thinking it's you know um, um, walking past the building sign seeing a guy with a hard hat do they actually understand the innovation, the complexity and the career path that, that can be given within construction, do you think we've got a problem at, at, at education or do you think that, there, it, that actually people do understand? No, I think there's a huge problem with education. I think okay. when, when people uh, think about construction, they still think about you know bricks and mortar. Really, yeah. Uh, I mean, construction methods have come on so far. Um, you know, even in the last ten years, especially with the introduction of uh, of new technologies um, such as you know um, drone mapping. Uh, mm. that, that's that's a new. Um, Qualification and a, a new job role within construction that not many people know exists. Yeah. Of course, BIM as well, etc. So there's there's uh, so many different roles within the construction industry that young people just aren't aware of. Yeah. Um, especially things in, in, in you know back office support, things like architectural departments, things like design and build departments. Um, you know, uh, all construction companies have a finance department, a HR department. So construction isn't only just about building. Yeah. It's the wider picture as well. Yeah, that's it's a really good point because um, 
I think there's lots of innovation out there mm -hmm. and, and some of the large businesses will, will, will take that in innovation to market and then probably will filter down to some of the smaller businesses they then embrace it but I think we have a responsibility or not just um, recruitment agencies who, who will be speaking with the talent but actually the industry as a whole has a responsibility to actually drive this innovation and the one that we're looking at recently the digital twin you know the you look at that technology and how that can drive efficiencies within construction it's just going to change the face of it Absolutely. but it's not really out there you know I only stumbled upon it and then researched it where you know I'm, I'm entrenched in, in, in construction as part of my job and I wasn't aware of it mm -hmm. so I think there is it's, it's, it's education it's, it's driving the innovation but we all, all have that responsibility Absolutely. Um, in terms of uh, your role um, how um, how are you going to be I guess getting the message to to these young people to inspire them you know how, how are you going to do that okay uh, I mean that's absolutely through education so it, it's it's the responsibility of construction companies and affiliated organizations like ourselves recruitment agencies that support the uh, the construction industry to go out um, go to the schools go into the communities um, go to further education establishments and go and speak to them and tell mm. them what's available uh, and hopefully um, set up special initiatives like traineeships where they can come and do tasters and testers of, of, of different opportunities available within construction okay. and hopefully you know give them that scope of different um, jobs that are available and hopefully find something that, that fits in with what they're looking for. Okay, so you mentioned a traineeship there. Could you just expand on, on what actually that is and what that entails? Absolutely. I mean, the government introduced a traineeship a few years back where they wanted to encourage more people into, into industry and into work. Um, so that is a, a partnership between an employer uh, uh, and a, a college or, or a further education okay. establishment and uh, what they do together they, they produce a program whereby they select um, youngsters between the ages of 16 and 24 to come onto the program uh, and, and they'll learn uh, industry standard um, things if you like so for instance within construction you know they might be on a 12 week course okay. where they uh, learn, uh, learn about health and safety they, they try out different trades they'll learn about manual handling asbestos awareness etc etc do their CSCS test and also have 100 hours work experience on site as well okay so that gives them a good footing into getting into the industry and it makes them work ready so when they go for their interviews they're not just green they can you know um, demonstrate to their empl potential employer that look I've done this at college I know manual handling I I I've tried different trades mm -hmm. I've had 100 hours you know work experience on site as well so it gives them a good footing to, to, to get into the industry and start an apprenticeship Okay, so what's the uh, pathway from the the twelve week traineeship? Mm -hmm. uh, what's the pathway for, for a youngster at that point? Uh, they've done their twelve weeks. Okay. Are they just then thrown in with the with the rest of the uh, the talent pool? Mm -hmm. What's the pathway for that youngster? Okay, what what tends to happen is um, the the client who's working with with the college will usually have a, a set number of apprentices they want to take. Okay, so they may say we want to take on ten apprentices out of the cohort. So oh, so it's it's actually into apprenticeship at that point absolutely okay yeah. so so once you know say, say for instance they want 10, ten apprentices at the end of that program so the college will um, hopefully to give them a, a good pool of people to choose from will we'll select about 30 people to go through that program so at the end of it 10 will be successful the other 20 will then uh, be advised by the early careers um, from the college and by ourselves as well if we're involved uh, with, the, with the traineeship uh, and try and get them into alternative employment because okay. what we can do is use our network of construction companies and say, look, guys, we've got these young individuals who've done these twelve-week course, who, who've you know covered all the, the, the necessary basics, yeah. who have done work experience on site as well. They're work ready. Interview them, give them a go, give them a chance. Okay. So it's a um, it, it, it's that work ready mm -hmm. young individual that you're going to offer an opportunity in the construction industry. Uh, in terms of employability, yes. obviously they're going through the education um, side of it. Um, 
is, is this what you're doing at PSR in terms of adding that value to that individual in terms of some of the, the maybe skills that they don't teach within an education environment? Um, and, and if so, what, what are those type of value adds that you'll be doing? Okay, so what we'll be doing is uh, we'll be monitoring the process throughout. So we'll have touch points throughout. So okay. uh, we'll be uh, involved in the induction process um, to give them a picture of the construction industry and what sort of jobs are available out there and what we could potentially support them with. And hopefully give in some case studies because we've had apprentices within PSR mm. uh, who, have done, who have done really, really well. So we can hopefully give them some case studies and show them what the future could potentially hold for them. Okay. Throughout their, their journey during doing the traineeship, um, there'll be touch points where we'll be going out and doing reviews with them. So mm. whilst they're at college, we'll do two reviews with them just to make sure you know that they're getting on okay. If there's any issues or concerns, we can iron them out. Uh, have a grading system whereby we can see how they're progressing. Hopefully those grades will get better as the reviews progress. Uh, we'll also review them when they're doing the work experience so we can go out on site and speak to the site teams and see how these, this individual is doing and towards the end of the program what we're also going to do is we're going to invite them in uh, and we're going to give them interview technique uh, preparation okay we're also going to give them CV writing uh, preparation and, and, and the most important thing uh, most recently is obviously social media and yes. their, their social media presence and how they can bolster themselves and, and, and look good to uh, future employers that's interesting and the social media aspect of this now um, I think young people uh, can be a little bit throw away with what they what they put on social media Absolutely. and then as they go into pe- professional environment and people are taking references from this sort of social media um, timeline mm-hmm. I think they need to be aware and, and, and be responsible with what they're putting out there and the impacts that that can have Absolutely. Um, so I like that that's been been added into to the traineeship um, I think you've talked very much about you know the traineeship into the the apprenticeship. Um, it's whose responsibility is it to get these individuals onto the programmes? Because we've talked that there's potentially a um, an issue with the talent coming into construction. Mm. How are we going to inspire them and demonstrate to them that? this is a career path and this is a credible career path that can be financially lucrative Mm -hmm. but you can be actually building and involved in shaping the cities, Mm -hmm. our future cities, there's so much involved in it. How how are, are you or PSR going to do that, or is it colleges? Is it the uh, the companies? What what's the, what's the what's the inspiration behind it? Okay, I think uh, for, I mean it's a very good question. It's everybody's responsibility. I think I think that's the that, that's the issue we have that there isn't any joint up thinking. If okay. you know what I mean. So um, construction companies try to do it on their own. Colleges try to do it on their own. They both have different agendas. Um, uh, recruitment companies as well. I mean, we're we're probably going to be one of the first people that are looking into this. You know, everybody has their own agenda, and there's no joint up thinking. Mm. I think what we need to do, we need to do more joint up thinking. So between us, between you know our client base and the colleges that we that we uh, work with and contract with, I think we need to all get together, sit around the table, and say, how can we make this work? What does good look like? How do okay. we inspire the future generation? And I think a lot of that will be through case studies. Mm. Um, okay. So people who have been through the process so we can inspire the next generation it's all well and good you know you and I or a company going and say come and join us this is what we do but you know that doesn't really add any value we want mm. to take young people who have been through the process you know especially um, you know probably more of the more mature generation like you and I who, who have been through the process and say look we started here as an apprentice look at where we are now mm. there's so many different pathways you can take okay. and inspire them that way uh, have some live, live case studies where you know they can relate to a young person saying well I could do that yeah yeah absolutely and I think um, the, the other potential um, crisis but issue we have in construction is the lack of um, lack of females um, for one it's very much a um, certain demographic within construction um, do you think and I think the figure at the minute in terms of if we focus on females in, in construction is is certainly uh, sub 20% I actually think it's lower than 15% um, 
Do you think it's realistic mm-hmm. that at some point in the future we could be looking at a above 30-40% mix of females to males in construction or do you actually think that's unrealistic and we need to make smaller steps? Okay, um, I think it's absolutely realistic, I really do because uh, I can see the shift already um, okay. doing what I, what I do and doing what I've done previously, going out and seeing employers, clients etc. I'm already seeing the shift, uh, especially at uh, higher levels if you like. Uh, just to give you an example, a, a construction company I used to work for previously had seven board members and out of the seven, four of them were female. Okay. Yeah, and those are the kind of people that we need to go out and speak to the next generation yes. uh, of, of females coming into the, con- or you know, who, who might be considering mm. coming into the construction industry, you know, so they can go and show them that, uh, you know, females in construction, you know, it's, it's a viable route and you can be very successful in it as well. Um, even on site, I'm seeing a shift on site as well mm. uh, because the, the cultural sh- site has changed, you know, yeah. with the introduction of considerate con- uh, constructors and equal opportunities, etc., etc. The, 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 the men on site, if you like, are more educated now. And to be honest, I, I've, I've noticed this as well. Trades women on site are, are, are really looked after by okay. the men on site. Now, right, which, okay. which, is really, which is really strange. So the men on site kind of, especially when they're young, um, the, the guys almost see them as, you know, uh, as sisters or daughters, if that makes yeah. sense. And they put their arm around them and they make sure they're okay and, you know, they make sure they're, they're doing well on site. So so yeah. there is a huge shift and I think as long as we continue with that shift, as long as we can promote it with, with females in the construction industry mm. who have been successful, then I think it's more than achievable. Okay. And I think the what you've touched on there is when we look at diversity and inclusion, it's the inclusion piece which is changing. They are being included, they are being looked after mm-hmm. uh, and, and I think that will then, that message that spreads is that actually this is a good career? This isn't this isn't a, a male-dominated environment, which is tough for a female to uh, be successful in. It's actually now embraced, and and those pathways to right through to board level are there. And that's a great example that you gave there with the with you know a, a fair percentage of board members being being females. Um, okay, so. Um, in terms of the the levy, if we can just pick this back up, sure. because I'm interested in uh, the apprenticeship levy, um, could you give us a, an overview of, of what it is, the apprenticeship levy? And um, if I refer back to an article I, I read just this week, that there is an awful lot of money um, in a pot somewhere um, that has not been accessed for some reason uh, that companies just aren't aware of it um, and what what we can we can do about helping them gain access to this pot so if you just give us an overview of the levy and then why we're in the position we are and, and what we can do about it absolutely the apprenticeship levy was introduced uh, by the government in 2017 um, it was uh, basically introduced to kind of encourage employers to take on more apprentices because okay. the government had a new target where they wanted to encourage more apprenticeships in the UK. Mm. So what they decided to do, they changed the whole funding um, landscape of how uh, apprenticeships are funded and what they started to do was uh, they uh, imposed a levy. The levy was payable uh, to any employer who has a three million pound wage below over. Okay. So if you have a three million pound wage below over, you have to contribute 0.5% of that total wage bill into the apprenticeship levy pot. Um, so you have this money sat in a levy pot as an organisation and what you have to do is the only way you can claim that money back is through apprenticeship training. Okay. Um, so, for instance, if PSR were paying into, into the apprenticeship levy, let's say we paid in £100,000 this year, the only way we can claim that money back is if we took on new apprentices okay. or if we upskilled our current staff through apprenticeship training. So ah, okay, can, so you can actually actually upskill your current workforce. Absolutely, and I think okay. that, that's a sticking point with a lot of employers that, that are aware of that, that are aware right. that you can use that money to upskill your existing staff because, I mean, let's let, you know, if you look at it around your organisation, you have future stars, you have people who you, who've got talent. You have people who, who need uh, development. Why not use that money? Why not use the apprenticeship route yeah. um, to, to upskill those individuals within the organisation? Okay. Um, I mean. Okay. To give you an example, the apprenticeship levy uh, has changed the landscape of apprenticeships as well. So before, right. if you thought of apprenticeships, you thought level two entry level jobs. That's no longer the case. Apprenticeships start at level two, which is equivalent to a GCSE, and they go all the way up to level seven now, which is equivalent to a master's degree. Wow, right. So okay. anybody within any organisation, you know, no matter what role they, they're doing, they could be a CEO, can now potentially do an apprenticeship. Okay, that is, um, that, that's, you know, that's news to me, and I think that is, um, 
must be part of the issue because again I think apprenticeships I think level two level three uh, it's a it's a it's a pathway into a, a business so if we think about level six level seven courses what 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 type of apprenticeship could be done within within construction for example than a business what what type of courses could these people be doing to upskill oh god you know you, you can do construction management uh, you right know, you can, if it's construction related uh, if you want people to become better managers there's the ILM CMI routes now as well. okay and the beauty about the, the, the higher level qualifications as well the the trading organizations have, have, uh, have recognized that employers want to use their apprenticeship levy so a lot of qualifications that you would have paid for commercial uh, previously there is now an apprenticeship equivalent yeah um, so to give you an example uh, I worked with a client not so long ago um, who had 180,000 pounds left in the levy but couldn't use it took an apprentice and said, look after how do we use this money and they just again thought purely entry level apprenticeships and said look there are so many apprenticeships you have a large organisation let's have a look at the, the rest of your organisation right okay so when I spoke to the accounts department when I spoke to the buying department you know when I spoke to the commercial department what do you guys do you know who are your future stars what qualifications are they undertaking so what I did, I did a scoping exercise. Right, okay. Um, so I, I sat down with the heads of the department, did a scoping exercise, and we basically converted a lot of their commercial paid training into apprenticeships. So buying teams did SIPs, uh, which they paid for commercially. Yep. There was now an apprenticeship equivalent. Accounts, did, accounts teams did AAT. Um, now there's an apprenticeship equivalent. Um, then you had a managers that were going to do ILM, level six, level seven, paying through the nose for that. But again, now there's an apprenticeship equivalent. So not only did I claim back all their uh, apprenticeship levy for them, but I also managed to save them about fifty thousand pounds in commercially paid training as well. Well, right, okay. So this is um, this could almost be game changer within uh, within the industry um, that that your company serves um, because we can upskill upskill that workforce. Yes, great, it's an entry level and it's a pathway from traineeship into uh, apprenticeship, but offering this to businesses, and this is already paid for, this pot exists. Yeah. Um, so can you just give us uh, an idea of how long this money sits in this uh, in this pot and how long they have to access it? Okay, absolutely, it's a very good question actually. Um, so it, the, the apprenticeship levy has a two year cycle. Okay. So um, the first, a pot of money that you would have paid into as an organization would have been in um, April 2017. So as of April 2019, that money starts to disappear if you don't use that money. Okay. So for example, if if if, us, if PSR as an organization put in 10,000 pounds in April 2017, yeah. if we haven't used that 10,000 pounds by April 2019, it disappears, it goes into a central government pot. Wow, right, okay. And if you think a lot of organizations, especially the larger ones, Pay up hundreds of thousands of pounds a yeah. month, and if they're not using it, they're going to lose it. Thanks a lot for that, Abdul. That's really insightful. Next steps for Abdul um, are, are going to be working with clients within the construction industry to educate them about the apprenticeship levy, uh, the, the funding that is available to them, and going out there and spreading the word of construction to um, to young people to inspire them into the industry, uh, and also upskilling workers within the industry and letting them know that they can access this uh, apprenticeship levy and I think the most important part for me uh, during the chat and, and, and I guess was news to me was the fact that apprenticeships now go up to that level seven we're talking about master's degree MSIPs qualifications AAT qualifications that in the form of apprenticeship you can access so Abdul's now going to be going out there and, and spreading the word uh, with, with his clients. I hope that everybody uh, enjoyed the interview uh, and we look forward to seeing the results uh, that Abdul is going to be producing at PSR in terms of bringing new people to the industry. So thank you for listening to the Inspire podcast. Uh, we're hoping to get the podcast on a weekly occurrence, getting new guests in each week, picking their brains, seeing what the inspiration behind them is, and delving a little bit deeper into businesses, culture, and inspiring everyone to achieve great things. 